Are we ready? Sergeant Bradley. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee of Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction jointly with the Committee on Hospitals. At this time, will all panelists please turn on their videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. To repeat, that's at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your co cooperation and we're ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. This meeting is called to order. I'm Council Member Diana Ayala. I wanna thank all of you for joining us for our virtual hearing today on this very important issue. Again, good morning. Um, Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. And I'd like to thank my colleague, Council Member Cardina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals for chairing this hearing with me today. I would also like to say thank you to everyone who is joining us this morning for this remote hearing. This morning, we are here to discuss the response of New York City hospitals to the mental health needs of frontline healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Arguably, there has never been a time in my lifetime anyway, when hospital workers have been called upon to face such an extraordinary set of challenges as the ones brought on by the novel coronavirus. During the COVID-19 crisis in New York City, highly skilled and seasoned frontline healthcare workers have had to rely not only upon their training, their compassion and their professionalism, but in many cases go well beyond the normal call of duty to ensure that patients in their care were given the best possible protection in sometimes less than optimal conditions. During the height of the pandemic, the sheer volume of patients entering New York City hospitals, many of whom were critically ill, coupled with a general lack of knowledge about how exactly to provide treatment and care for those stricken with a highly infectious and unknown disease, proved to be a daunting task that required relentless, round-the-clock kind of vigilance for many of the hospital workers' parts with caregiving. Exposure to the highly contagious virus forced many workers into self-imposed isolation from loved ones and families to avoid transmission. This was in and of itself incredibly stressful and the inability to provide, to process and de-escalate emotionally with loved ones after a long day shift is a setting, in a setting where patients are constantly in crisis is exhausting for all. COVID-19 has taken a physical, mental and emotional health toll on all of our hospital workers who continue to provide a safe place for everyone to do very important, but at times dangerous work. We wanna thank all of the frontline health workers for continuing to give everything that they have to ensure their patients receive the best care of care during this unprecedented crisis. It's wonderful that we clap for them every night at 7 p.m. But now we, we need to make sure that they, that they have what they need to stay emotionally healthy for the days, the months, and years to come. This hearing will allow the committee to examine the critical role quality mental health services play during this extraordinary time for New York City hospitals and their frontline healthcare workers. I want to thank the representatives from Health and Hospitals, the administration, and the Greater New York uh, Hospital Association who are here today for their commitment to ensuring quality mental health services are available for all New York City hospital employees. And I look forward to hearing about what is being done to ensure that these services are delivered when and where they are needed, and the role that the City Council can play in supporting these efforts. I also want to thank my colleagues, as well as my committee staff, Senior Council Sarah Liss, Legislative Policy Analyst Chrissy Dwyer, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, and my new Deputy Chief of Staff, Michelle Cruz, for making this hearing possible. I now turn to Chair Rivera for opening. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Ayala. Good morning. My name is Carlina Rivera, and I am the Chair of the Committee on Hospitals. And of course, I just want to thank Council Member Ayala again for chairing this hearing with me today. I'd also like to thank all of you who have joined us for this remote hearing. As Council Member Ayala discussed, we are here today to examine the need to ensure access to meaningful mental health care for our hospital frontline workers. This pandemic is unlike anything we have ever seen before and has caused an immeasurable amount of stress on our hospital system and frontline healthcare workers. There were reports in late March that patients with COVID-19 symptoms 
were showing up at some hospitals every three to five minutes. A doctor with Elmhurst Hospital in Queens described conditions to the New York Times as apocalyptic and said that patients had died while awaiting treatment. With shortages of personal protective equipment, PPE, throughout the hospital system, there were reports of some healthcare workers having to resort to wearing trash bags or rain ponchos for, to protect themselves from the virus. The city's paramedics were reportedly stretched so thin trying to respond to the increase in calls during the peak of the crisis that they were told to leave cardiac arrest sufferers at home if they did not have a pulse. Eventually in mid-April, the strain on the city's hospitals slowly began to ease as the number of new cases and hospitalizations started to decline. Thankfully, the worst case scenarios projected in March did not come to pass. Nevertheless, it is undeniable that we are facing a massive need for mental health services in our hospital workforce. Hospitals need to ensure that they are doing everything they can to preserve and bolster the health of their workforce including through proactive measures that protect their staff's physical and mental well-being, like ensuring and maintaining adequate and safe staffing levels. As we learned from point in testimony during the committee's hearing on the safety of New York City emergency departments back in February, the need to facilitate access to mental health services for a hospital workforce has long been evident. Even before the pandemic, the phrase moral injury developed to describe the experience of veterans had increasingly come to replace what was commonly known as burnout to describe the struggles physicians face on the job. Moral injury refers to the emotional, physical, and spiritual harm people feel after perpetrating, failing to prevent, or bearing witness to acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. Before the pandemic, four in 10 physicians reported feelings of burnout and the physician suicide rate was more than double that of the general population. In addition, the rate of nurse suicide was increasing. The pandemic will likely exacerbate these pre-existing mental health needs in the hospital community. This has been seen in other countries as well as in our own city with the tragic deaths by suicide of emergency medical technician, John Mondello and emergency physician, Lorna Breen. I wanna emphasize that we are here today to discuss all hospital staff, including both medical and non-medical staff. I am speaking to all of our city's doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, pharmacists, technicians, administrators, clerical staff, maintenance workers, and hospital food workers. All of our hospital workers experienced the pandemic up close and were under immense amounts of pressure. The pandemic incited a wartime-like mentality with staff working with no end in sight and no true understanding of the enemy, a new virus we are still struggling to learn about. While hospital workers are heroes, they shouldn't be viewed as people who don't need help. The title of hero may negate the fact that they are people, people who can be vulnerable, people who can struggle, and people who need proactive support. Today, I wanna to hear about the city's response to the mental health needs of our hospital workforce, including about what measures hospitals have considered to mitigate the mental and emotional toll on doctors and nurses of complying with state issued triage guidelines during this pandemic. I know that h, &H for example, has their Helping Healers Heal, Heal program, which addresses the mental health needs of staff by providing a 24 seven behavioral health helpline staffed by psychiatrists and psychologists one-on-one -on -one peer and group support, as well as other services which aim to identify and support employees showing symptoms of anxiety, depression, fatigue, and burnout, and connect them to services if requested. Additionally, at the end of April, the launch of a new program entitled the Hero New York Mental Health Training Initiative for Frontline Workers was announced. The program tailors DOD's Combat Stress Management Resilience Program designed for military personnel to the needs of medical personnel through the use of assessments and webinar trainings. It uses a train the trainer approach and those who receive training will then provide trainings to mental health specialists, spiritual care and second victim program leads at their respective healthcare systems. Today we will discuss these programs as well as other efforts and I look forward to learning more about their participation rates, programming and how they meet our workers where they are. Trauma informed practice is an art. Many people may be reluctant to seek mental health services for fear of it impacting their career and out of reluctance to discuss emotions. 
it is intimidating to disclose such needs to one's employer. Now that we are past the first peak of the pandemic and our workers have time to come up for air, we have to make sure we are there to support them. I want to learn more about how we ensure that workers are encouraged to seek assistance, even if they may not feel they need it at first, and how we are assuring them that services will be private and also equitable. I wanna know that our programming serves each member of the hospital team and that such programs are made with this diverse population in mind. Today I am asking, how are our hospitals taking responsibility in proactively ensuring that our workforce is healthy? The responsibility, the need to actively reach out, the need to ask for help should not fall on our hospital staff. Thank you all again for being here today and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Chair Rivera. We will now hear some remarks from Public Advocate William. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Ayala. And I want to also thank you and Chair Rivera uh, for this hearing today, as well as the members of the Committee on Hospitals and Committee on Mental Health, Disability, and Addiction uh, for holding this very important oversight hearing on response to our city's hospitals to to the mental health needs of our frontline healthcare workers. To all of our essential workers, thank you for keeping our city running during this pandemic. And to those of you who are in the healthcare industry or associated and the many volunteers who came to New York from all over the country, uh, thank you. As uh, most of us were told to keep socially distanced, uh, you were asked and accepted the call to get up close and personal uh, to the people who were affected. So thank you for doing your best to keep us alive during this pandemic. We will continue to feel the impact of the coronavirus long after this pandemic is over. This public health crisis has had a detrimental effect on the mental health of a significant number of New Yorkers, many of whom are doctors, nurses, EMTs, paramedic, and hospital workers and administration, administrators. Many of them, and too many, have lost their lives to COVID-19. Uh, and those who did not uh, have suffered the trauma of seeing patients and their colleagues die from the virus, which has severely impacted and can continue to impact your mental health. All of us should recognize the difficult job the healthcare workers in the city have had to carry out during this pandemic and the trauma they have experienced because of it. What is even more unfortunate is the fact that this trauma has driven a number of these healthcare workers to take their own lives. My thoughts and prayers and prayers of healing are with this family, with those families and those individuals. Given this horrific, horrifying impact, the city the state and the city have taken steps to provide aid to those healthcare professionals struggling with COVID-related trauma. In early May, the State Department of Financial Services began requiring New York regulated health insurers to waive all cost-sharing fees, including deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance for in-network mental health services for frontline workers. The agency also issued an emergency regulation prohibiting insurers from imposing out-of-pocket costs for telehealth and in-person mental health services rendered by in-network providers on an outpatient basis. The state also created, established a crisis text line to provide 24 seven emotional support for frontal healthcare workers. At the end of April, the mayor announced an initiative, initiative with the Department of Defense here in the city where the US military trauma specialists will provide counseling to our city's frontline workers intended to help healthcare workers overcome the trauma inflicted by this pandemic. The program was expected to be fully operational as of May. As part of the initiative, trauma specialists assess individual hospitals and tailor programs to fit their needs. They also train small groups at each hospital in combat stress management, who will later train an additional 1,000 public and private hospital staff. The service will continue to be available after the pandemic ends. While both of these initiatives are good first steps taken by the administration at the state government, city level, we cannot say for sure they are effective until we know the extent to which they have been implemented. Moreover, if it, it is unclear if these services have been extended to non-residential healthcare workers and volunteers. And while there are no citywide COVID-19 statistics of deaths by suicide yet available, anecdotal evidence hints at an increase in New York is taking their own lives, especially after the past, over the past three months. Emotional stress, social isolation, lack of access to mental health care at the start of this pandemic, and the closure of churches and houses of worship and community centers are among the troubling factors brought on by this public health crisis that have impacted the mental well-being of, mental, of many New Yorkers. As if COVID-19 is not horrible enough, we also have to worry about racism and how the recent cases of 
police brutality have affected black and brown New Yorkers, many of whom are healthcare workers themselves. Many of them I've seen on the streets also protesting after their shifts are over. They now have to deal with trauma from the coronavirus in addition to the trauma that comes with seeing a systemic racism continue to take the lives of members of communities of more color. It is hard to say what the long-term impact of COVID-19 on mental health will be. However, the city, will, city has the ability to minimize the harm that it will inflict on New Yorkers. It is important to look at the efforts that we are putting toward treating COVID-19 patients whose physical health is at risk and put that same energy towards treating the mental health of those of us who have been traumatized by this virus. I look forward to hearing how our hospitals have utilized their resources to ensure that our frontline workers are getting the mental health treatment they need and particularly knocking down the stigmas associated uh, with getting the mental health services that we all need. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, now acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us, Council Members Cabrera, Andrew Samuel, Reynoso, Borelli, Moya, uh, Levine, and Van Bramer. Hopefully I didn't um, forget anyone. And I will now turn it over to our uh, committee council to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Zayala and Rivera. I am Zay Emanuel Hailu, Counsel to the Hospitals Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please note that we will not be allowing a second round of questions. Thank you. For public testimony, after the first panelist, individuals will be called up in a panel of three. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. From Health and Hospitals, Dr. Eric Way, Dr. Charles Barron, Dr. Rebecca Lynn Walton, Jeremy Segal, and from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Dr. Myla Harrison. I will first read the oath, and after, I will call on each panelist here from the administration individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Wei? I do. Dr. Barron? Um, we should order, um, like okay. with the campaign stuff, bags or like masks, okay. or like um, staff. Over to uh, Dr. Lynn Walton. I do. Mr. Segal. Just as a reminder, there is a delay when uh, you are unmuted. I do. Thank you. Dr. Harrison. I do. And Dr. Barron. Uh, 
I do. Thank you. Dr. Ray, you may begin when ready. Thank you, Dr. Oh, I guess I was on mute. I'll start over. Uh, so good morning, Chairpersons Rivera, Chairperson Ayala, members of the Committee on Hospitals, as well as the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. My name is Eric Way. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Quality Officer for New York City Health and Hospitals. I'm joined today by Dr. Charles Barron, our Deputy Chief Medical Officer, who leads the Office for Behavioral Health. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify before you today on New York City Health and Hospitals response to the mental health needs of frontline healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this is a topic that's very near and dear uh, to my heart. Uh, I'm an emergency medicine physician uh, working shifts at Kings County in the emergency department during the peak of the, the surge, things that I've never imagined seeing before. Uh, I will never be the same um, after this first peak of COVID-19. And I know no, none of the healthcare workers and those who are supporting the healthcare workers uh, will ever be the, the same uh, after what we went through in March, April, and, and early May. Uh, I think New York City Health and Hospitals um, was well positioned to support frontline staff going into this pandemic. Uh, we had two very established and very strong teams uh, the Helping Healers Heal H3 team, as well as our behavioral health services. So our behavioral health services provides over 60% of the volume of behavioral health in New York City. Uh, it's led by Dr. Charles Barron and a very strong team centrally, as well as our psychiatry chairs uh, and directors uh, at the facilities. Our Helping Healers Heal team was the first thing that Dr. Mitchell Katz and I decided that I should work on upon arriving in January of 2018. We had created a similar program, the H3 program at LAC USC in Los Angeles and spread um, throughout the second largest safety net system in the country, which is Department of Health Services of the County of Los Angeles. And so the Helping Healers Heal program is basically built upon the premise that healthcare workers have empathy and healing powers. That's what drives us to go into healthcare in the first place is to help others. And we give it freely all day long to patients and their families. Uh, however, when it comes to giving that same empathy and that healing power towards each other, the culture of the house of medicine was actually the opposite of that. And it is very hard to make it through medical school and residency and to work in a career uh, of medicine, same with nursing. And so it almost felt like a rite of passage. And there was a saying in nursing that nurses eat their young. And we all had attendings who said that they worked more hours in a day than there, there are in a day. And so we just need to toughen up uh, and get stronger. And so it was very much a culture of don't show weakness, don't show how things that should affect the human being affect you. And so the Helping Healers Heal program is based upon peer support. And it is, right, let's take that culture and flip it uh, around where if something happens that we know is traumatizing, a child is in a car accident and doesn't make it through the trauma resuscitation, we know that is going to affect every parent or every person who, right, children hold 
a, a dear part of our hearts. Um, and so being able to reach out and say, that must have been really tough, right? Let me share with you when I lost a child in the trauma, uh, you know, how did I feel? How did I get through it? Don't suffer alone. And so that's tier one. Can we change the frontline culture to one of, instead of gossiping about a tough case that somebody else had, we all go to them and provide support, right? Tier two is trained peer support champions. And so the goal here is to have a directory of every discipline, every shift, every unit across every facility in New York City Health and Hospitals that we could call upon to activate sort of like a rapid response team. A rapid response team is if somebody's blood pressure drops, if their heart rate gets too high, if their breathing becomes difficult, uh, we activate specialists to go to the bedside and try to uh, solve the problem or solve the issues. Uh, so this would be an emotional psychological rapid response where we can activate H3 peer support champions to meet with somebody one on one or meet with an entire group and do a group debrief. And so going into this pandemic, we had over 1000 trained peer support champions, as well as our behavioral health services. And what we knew is immediately that this following the news of what was happening in China and in other countries such as Italy we knew that this was gonna be something that our staff have never experienced before. And our top priority here at New York City Health and Hospitals is to support our staff, our most precious resource. Staff that are supported, that are well, that are healthy, are going to be able to provide higher quality and safer patient care uh, and take care to do the most good for, for New York City. And so we had the two teams team up and form a steering committee around COVID-19 emotional and psychological support. And out of that steering committee, we created a behavioral health hotline that's available to staff to call. They can remain anonymous. Uh, we created an intranet page around all of our COVID resources, but it also has emotional and psychological support resources. We uh, did refreshers for our Helping Healers Heal peer support champions and got the H3 uh, intranet page ready to be able to take uh, encounter requests. But we know that in the peak of this, that people did not have the opportunity to, did not always have the opportunity to leave their clinical areas. There was just too much, too many patients, too much you know, demands uh, clinically. And so what we decided to do is start wellness rounds. So let's have our H3 leads and our behavioral health leads go to where the staff are, go to the emergency departments, go to the ICUs, go to the medical surgical wards uh, where we're cohorting COVID patients and look for signs of anxiety and burnout and second victimization and moral injury, compassion fatigue, and reach out to them immediately, provide them with resources, uh, make it easier for them to, to seek help, right? We also created respite wellness rooms across the, uh, the system. Um, at the peak, we had 31 across our acutes and post-acutes. Uh, currently we have 27. Uh, and these respite wellness rooms are staffed stocked with water, with snacks. Our H3 and behavioral health leads are there in case they want to speak to somebody on the spot. Uh, but they're meant to be areas away from the chaos of the ICUs, the bells, the whistles, uh, the alarms, uh, to be able to, to get away and de-stress. Um, and so at the peak, um, we had 240 uh, staff visit the Elmhurst uh, wellness respite room uh, in one day. Uh, so far, we've had um, 50 to over 52,000 visits to our wellness respite areas. And the one that, that I was most impressed with was at Metropolitan Hospital. It wasn't even one room, it was an entire ward. They had a meditation room, a quiet room, they had an art room, they had a community, you know, communal dining area that was uh, socially distanced where the donated food was brought to, as well as bedrooms for staff to take naps uh, or spend the night um, if they needed to. Uh, through generous donations, um, we've been able to raise over $27 million um, in a disaster relief fund to send comforts to the frontline staff. Uh, we knew with social distancing, with working additional hours, working in full PPE all the time, uh, that there was additional burden on our frontline staff. And so 
things that are so as simple as getting groceries or feeding their families uh, would become more difficult. If, uh, if they wanted to stay isolated uh, from their children or from their elderly parents, that would become more difficult. And so through this philanthropy, uh, th philanthropic effort, we've been able to send meals you know, to all of our staff. Uh, we've been able to provide groceries to take home after shift. We've been able to uh, provide wellness packs. Um, we've been able to provide transportation uh, as well as um, uh, other comforts um, to, to reduce the burden on our frontline staff. Additionally, we, we know that the topics uh, in a pandemic um, or the knowledge and, and the skills um, are slightly different. And so we've been able to do a lunchtime webinar series over uh, 34 uh, trainings. Um, and this is open to all frontline staff as well as managers, teaching them things about around empathy, having difficult conversations, uh, stress management, uh, that we've received a lot of positive feedback, especially from managers who feel more uh, empowered, as well as prepared to have supporting conversations with their staff. And it's something that we're uh, very excited about um, is this seven agency collaboration. We're very grateful to the mayor, the first lady of New York City, as well as the US Department of Defense. So not only did our military partners come in and provide uh, much needed clinical care to COVID-19 patients at the peak of the surge, they actually were the ones who, who reached out to us and said, this is the closest that we've seen to a combat situation in a civilian hospital or a civilian setting. Can we share some of the lessons learned that the Department of Defense uh, has, has gained through being at war for the past 18 years? And so what started as a conversation between the Department of Defense and New York City Health and Hospitals quickly grew to include uh, FDNY, uh, Greater New York Hospital Association, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Veteran Affairs, as well as the Uniform Services University of Health uh, Sciences. And these seven agencies came together, met daily for an entire month to take two uh, needs assessment tools that the Department of Defense utilizes, one for the entire unit, which is a macro assessment, as well as one that is used for an individual soldier, which is a micro uh, needs assessment, adapting that to civilian healthcare around COVID-19, uh, as well as taking their curriculum on combat stress management and resilience and adapting that into a train the trainer that would be applicable to civilian healthcare as well as uh, uh, first responders. And so Greater New York Hospital Association is hosting a train the trainer series in our first two lunchtime uh, hour long webinars, we had 704 people uh, across uh, New York City and greater New York uh, healthcare facilities log in. Uh, on the second one, we have 589. Uh, there are three more modules to go. And what the idea is, is to take behavioral health leads as well as staff support leads to go and get this master training and bring it back to their respective facilities and train up their existing uh, programs. So for New York City Health and Hospitals, we want our 1,000 plus H3 peer support champions to undergo this combat stress management resilience training, as well as our behavioral health service providers. Uh, that way, when they are supporting staff today, uh, tomorrow, as well as well into the future, what we've learned from our Department of Defense partners will make that support that much stronger. So I think um, in summary, uh, we know that um, this is a, a great risk um, to our healthcare frontline heroes. Uh, this is something that is a top priority for New York City health and hospitals. My worst fear, my nightmare is that we have a mental health crisis on top of the public health crisis that COVID-19 presented a pack that I ask every, everyone who undergoes H3 training with me and my team is that we make the pack that we've all seen the negative effects of second victimization, people dropping out of the field, 
depression, suicide, let's not lose one more colleague, friend, uh, healthcare worker to the effects of second victimization. That remains my commitment, uh, as well as the commitment of uh, Charles Barron uh, and our entire system is to support our staff so that we do not relive uh, the tragic, the tragedies uh, that we've seen in New York City um, so far with with suicide. Um, and I uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and we look forward to your questions. Okay, um, are we ready for the next person? So I believe now we're um, uh, ready for any questions you may have, Chair Ayala. Sorry. Bear with us. This is a new era. This, this is a new system that we're all um, operating under. It's very stressful. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Wade. That was very, uh, very informative. Um, and I, I just, you know, I want to say that, you know, I, you know, thank you. Thank you. I, I cannot even begin to imagine what having to live through this pandemic from within the confines of a public hospital or a, any hospital must have been like. Um, my mother actually had a, a heart attack right in the beginning, right before the pause, and the hospitals were starting to kind of institute a, a policy. Um, and, you know, it, they, they did so, so graciously. And um, I just, you know, applaud all of the efforts of our healthcare workers. and. You know, whether you were working in the emergency room, the phlebotomy room, whether you were, you know, changing blankets or calling family members and, you know, cleaning up um, and, and sterilizing. Um, I, I cannot imagine you not being impacted in some way. And that's kind of what prompted, um, you know, our uh, interest in having this, this hearing today because we wanted to better understand um, from your perspective, what life was like, right, leading up to the pandemic and being in, in the midst of all of that, um, in the height of it. Um, and it, it sounds like, you know, as a result, a lot of, a lot has come, you know, a lot of the services have become available. Um, but I have a couple of questions regarding, um, you know, and I, I know there's a lot of questions that my colleagues will, you know, will have regarding some of the programs, so I don't want to, um, get too specifically into those, but wanted to, I'm sorry, my, I don't know how to work this thing. One of my computers is like me. Um, but regarding the steering committee, can you, can you um, explain a little bit about when uh, the steering committee was established? Was that uh, something that was established in the midst of the COVID crisis? Was that something that um, h and had been, um, you know, discussing prior? Yeah, so uh, I'm happy to, to start and I'll turn it over to, to Jeremy Siegel, uh, who has been uh, chairing this committee and, and leading the meetings. Uh, so I don't want it to, to seem like we weren't collaborating very closely between behavioral health services and H3 before this, because we were. We had a H3 central steering committee in each facility. The 18 teams had their own steering committee. And about 20 to 30 percent, depending on which team, are actually behavioral health providers, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers. And so we were already collaborating very closely. Uh, this steering committee uh, was formed early on uh, in, you know, when we had our first case in, in New York City. Uh, and this new steering committee was dedicated just to COVID-19. We knew this was going to present a unique and, and different challenge to us. And so, Jeremy, do you want to add to that? 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, good uh, morning, everyone. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. My name is Jeremy Siegel, the Chief Wellness Officer uh, for NYC Health and Hospitals, pronouns he, him, his. Um, so uh, as Eric had just mentioned, the Atri Steering Committee was uh, initially launched at the central level to support all of the C-suites across all of our service lines uh, to establish facility or site-specific or borough-based steering committees. Uh, right before uh, the main surge uh, of COVID-19, we really um, expanded the steering committee across the system to include patient safety, pastoral care, uh, patient experience, IT, workforce development, emergency management, uh, in addition to all the other stakeholders that were previous, previously on the uh, steering committee, including the Office of Behavioral Health, Office of Patient-Centered Care, which is nursing, uh, as well as medical and professional affairs. So we really wanted to make sure that the steering committee was representative of our diverse workforce. Uh, H3 is for the people by the people. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that not only were clinical disciplines, department services represented, but also ancillary non-clinical, uh, as well as to make sure that we had a diverse makeup of the steering committee to represent all the perspectives and voices across our system. Um, when it's, I, I wanted to also acknowledge that Council Member uh, Michelle has joined us as well. Um, so, was it at the so was the well, were the wellness rounds um, created as a result of feedback from the steering committee? Yes. Uh, so, I think right our, our initial our initial thoughts were let's leverage what exists. So, um, allowing managers, supervisors, allowing frontline staff, colleagues to initiate H3 encounters through our intranet website, as well as asking or emailing directly to our H3 uh, emails. Uh, we also, you know, immediately started working on these West respite wellness rooms, um, but feedback from, you know, myself working shifts, as well as others on the steering committee is that you know, it often is those most impacted who have the least opportunity to leave their clinical areas, right? If the emergency department is seeing a new patient every three to five minutes, they're not going to be able to leave their clinical area to, to go there, S similarly with the ICUs. And so what we wanted to do is meet the staff where they, they were. So instead of having only H3 and, and behavioral health providers in the respite wellness rooms, or you know, needing to be activated through the H3 intranet site, we said, let's do proactive rounds. Let's go to where the, the staff are and proactively look for all those concerning signs for second victimization. And so that was how, how it was borne out. Um, I don't know, if R Rebecca, would you like to add to, to my answer there? Um, I think it's been a it's been a very close collaboration through both offices to ensure that we're really creating a no wrong door approach, which is how we treat patients in the system. Where anywhere you come into the system, whether it's the emergency room or outpatient clinics, there's no wrong way to access behavioral health, and we've really done our best to create that for our staff as well. So you can walk down the hall, see a flyer. You can be engaged during a wellness round. You can be engaged through uh, access the intranet, which we're all used to checking on a daily basis with any news and updates, and there's tons of resources that are really easily accessible. You don't have to hunt around to get to them. And then there's also uh, knowledge through email and word of mouth so that people can access the behavioral health hotline should they not want to be talking in person or going to the respite room or can't or want to talk when they're done with their with their service, or they can access the EAP that we all have access to as city employees if they want to go fully outside of the system. So we're really trying to make sure everyone can access in a way that feels comfortable to them when they're ready. Understood. Um, was the same was the same level? I mean, how did how did the wellness? I mean, obviously it's easier to identify or to visibly observe uh, a person that may be you know uh, overwhelmed. Um, how how was that service transferred over to uh, healthcare workers who were then you know diagnosed um, positive for COVID and um, quarantined into I know some of them were in hotels because they weren't able to self isolate at home. Um, did that did that service did that level of service you know go with them? Um, was that part of the steering committee's recommendation? Uh. Yeah, so um, let me know if I'm uh, interpreting the, the question is if somebody uh, 
test positive, an employee tests positive, and they need to leave the clinical area, uh, either to isolate at home or in a hotel, if they you know can't isolate safely at home. Are they still? Are these services still available to them? Uh, yes. So um, we made these services available uh, to our hotels. We've actually done H3 debriefs at the hotels for staff, um, you know, both internal to health and hospitals as well as external. We brought in, you know, outside staffing to help uh, support the surge. Um, and this is available to volunteers. This is available to affiliate staff. Um, it's not just H and H employees. We want to no one to fall through the cracks. Everyone uh, who touches our facilities and, and our patients, and even those outside uh, of our, our system, we care about them as human beings, as healthcare workers. We don't want anyone to to fall through the cracks. Uh, and so the hotline, H three debriefs, um, all the resources we listed on the internet. If, staff did not feel comfortable interacting with their own system because of the stigma around, you know, seeking mental health uh, services. There are um, national anonymous hotlines uh, that are listed as, as resources. And this is a lot of the work that, that Helping Healers Heal has been doing for the last two and a half years is to make a, a robust list of what we call tier three resources. Not everyone who loses a patient needs to speak to a psychiatrist. But let's not make somebody who needs to speak to a psychiatrist wait a month because they have to find a primary care physician to make a referral and get approval through their health insurance. Let's link them to resources within 24 hours. And so that's the tier three resources. So not everyone is going to right, have a preference to, to speak to somebody within their own hospital or even within their own system. And so do we have outside resources? Do we have you know, anonymous resources? And so those are all available to, to anyone, whether they're in quarantine or not. Can you remind me again who was responsible for doing the wellness rounds? Were those mental health professionals or peers? So it was a combination of our helping healers heal peer support champions as well as behavioral health providers. So basically the you know, often the leads. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I, I I have one last question and then I want to pass it over to my colleagues. Um, I mean, is that, is, is, do you feel that there were lessons learned um, through this process that, that would better prepare, help prepare the health and hospitals um, team and uh, mental health providers throughout the city um, to deal with a pandemic like this? I mean, I, I, I don't imagine, you know, uh, I'm mean, not sure we'll see, a, we'll see a resurgence, right? But we have, you know, uh, climate issues, we've seen, you know, severe uh, weather, um, there are, you know, things happen. Is, is, was there, was, was, did, you, did you walk away or are you walking away because we're still in the midst of this, right? And there's still so much uncertainty with a sense that you, you know, there were lessons learned that, you know, that we can apply, um, you know, should we need to in the future? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, right, we would be uh, incredibly, uh, irresponsible to, to say that there weren't lessons learned uh, throughout um, the surge, right? This is a once in a century event, uh, a, a viral pandemic. Uh, and just like if we were able to take the same test over, we might have to, we might, you know, do many things or answer many things uh, differently. Uh, does not mean that what everyone did uh, throughout the entire surge was do everything in their powers to save as much as many lives as possible um and so i think right we are very much still in the pandemic and it's actually i found after kind of the bell curve of that first peak passed each clinical area so it passed the emergency department first as social distancing measures were working that was the first opportunity that many of the staff who work in the emergency department had to, to really catch their breath and then process all the trauma that they had been through, right? While you were, right, I felt like we were drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, it was adrenaline, right? 18 hour days, right? Just go, 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 do everything you can. Adrenaline, there's no time to process. It was really when, you know, I showed up to a shift and I was like, where did all the patients go? 
And then I realized, right, everyone around me was starting to process, is starting to work through the grief. They had seen so much critical illness and had seen so much death uh, that everyone was in a different stage of the grieving process uh, yeah. for their patients, um, the moral injury, uh, all those things were flooding in. So we rapidly said, while uh, the volume is down, right, because as the COVID volume decreased, uh, the community was still not coming back to the emergency department right away for fear of being exposed to the virus. We said, let's do group debriefs outside, eight, 10, 12 staff members, multidisciplinary, let's go out into the ambulance ramp, folding chairs six feet apart and process together and uh, set an internal goal for every staff member, regardless of discipline to be part of a group debrief. And so multi multiple goals here. So one, you can't explain to anyone what it was like in the emergency department. The people who really truly know how you're feeling and what you went through are those who had that shared lived experience. Those who were shoulder to shoulder with you, you know, in the peak uh, of the surge. And so processing together, it's very therapeutic with peers. And a lot of staff have actually told me they feel more supported at, at work than they do at home because their friends and family just can't understand, right, what they went through. And so uh, the group debrief allows individuals to identify maybe I need more services, more support, right? Hearing what other people are going through and also gives their colleagues the opportunity to say, hey, Dr. Wei is, uh, is struggling a bit, right? Can we have helping healers heal, come back and meet with him one-on-one? -on -one? Can we uh, all like make a, a commitment to reach out to him so that he's not sitting at home, you know, trying to cope with this alone? And so the, the more opportunities to not let somebody fall through the cracks. Thank you so much. And if I didn't say it enough, thank you to all of you um, for all of your work. And I want to turn it over to Chair Rivera. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Ayala. And thank you for mentioning some of the, I guess the feelings, the fears, <laughs> of all of the hospital workers. Um, you know, I, I've read a lot of articles and about programs across the country and even globally on, on what hospital systems are trying to do for their workers. And I think, you know, the answer, well, some of the feelings that the hospital workers feel are, are reports of being afraid to stop, right? Because if you do and you look around, it'll be overwhelming. Or if you stop, you'll crash or as you mentioned, there's passion fatigue. There are so many things that the workers are dealing with. And I know that you are trying your best to meet those needs. So I wanted to ask a little bit about the program itself and to get some numbers. And so we can figure out, again, we wanna be supportive of the work that you're doing and, and we wanna figure out how we can help you resource wise. Mm -hmm. So um, who exactly participates in the program? You mentioned medical and non-medical staff welcome to take part in the programming. And you mentioned some of the focus of the programming. Um, are there any lessons learned since you first launched the program? And, and when exactly did you first launch the program? So I know I gave you a few questions. When did you first launch the program? What are some of the numbers of people who participate? And if you can go into a little bit about um, some of the, the program focus in terms of um, how many, not just how many people have participated, but how are you informing the workers on what's available? Okay, so uh, I'll try to remember all, all those questions. All right, I'll uh, remember so, you. so number one, number one uh, when did the programs uh, start? So Behavioral Health Services has been here uh, since the beginning of, of New York City Health and Hospitals. Um, um, I'm not sure, maybe Charles could answer when the Office of, of Behavioral Health was formed at its own service line uh, in, in central office. Uh, the Helping Healers Heal program, uh, I was here maybe two weeks before I introduced the topic uh, in a system-wide webinar. This was in February of 2018. Uh, and I challenged each of the CEOs across our system to identify one to two H3 leads uh, to create an internal steering committee 
we launched our first team in July of 2018, and that was Jacoby. And over the next 12 months, uh, basically launched uh, 17 more teams. And so this is every acute hospital, every post-acute facility, community care in Gotham, our ambulatory clinic uh, uh, network, um, all have their own teams. And so it was a similarly a train the trainer uh, where Jeremy, myself, and Jeanette Baxter, our, our corporate risk manager, would provide the first training to the first 30 to 50 peer support champions. Uh, and part of that training was to hand off to the local H3 steering committee leads, uh, who then would train up to get to the 250 to 300 or so uh, um, peer support champions that we felt like would cover every unit, every discipline, every shift. And so uh, they have continued providing trainings on their local schedules. Um, for who is involved, so when we asked uh, for the first 30 to 50 peer support champions, we said, make sure you remember uh, all the non-clinical uh, disciplines as well. So we had environmental services staff, we had hospital police, we had administrators, we had radiology techs, as well as doctors and nurses, um, and those that you, you classically think about as, as clinical folks. Uh, and so I think that is one of the, the beautiful things that we've seen with H3, both in Los Angeles as well as New York City, is that people tend to um, look out for, for their own clan or their own discipline, their own unit. Uh, but what we have seen here is you'll have a pediatrics intern pointing out that they saw um, the hospital police officer with their eyes wide open and jaw dropped, you know, watching that pediatric trauma uh, happen and, and, right, noticing that EVS worker is the one who has to mop up the blood after a gunshot wound. Um, and so looking out for each other, regardless of, of title, discipline, as human beings. And so that's been um, uh, a, a, a much welcomed and uh, success, I think, uh, of this program. We have uh, trained over a thousand peer support champions who have provided over 700 one-on-one -on -one and group debriefs um, that were locked. And so we know this happens in real time. I can't show up to an emergency medicine shift without a few people, three to five people say, you know, sometime during the shift, do you have time to talk uh, about a case that I'm struggling with, right? And so not all of those get ended up getting tracked, uh, but that's a change in culture. Um, uh, so those were some of the numbers, and the thousand include all disciplines um, uh, across uh, the system. Um, so Charles, do you want to talk about the Behavioral Health Office of Behavioral Health uh, when it was uh, formed as its own service line and uh, some numbers there? Can I just ask you one more uh, follow-up question? Is how many people have participated in the Helping Healers Heal program? since the beginning yeah. of the pandemic? Since the beginning of the pandemic. So our tracking actually uh, fell off a bit during the pandemic. And that's because everybody was just doing whatever they could to um, meet the need and meet the demand. And so I don't blame our H3 peer support champions for not wanting to go back to the internet to fill out the post and counter form when they were providing so much support in the wellness respite rooms as well as the wellness rounds. Uh, we know these are, you know, we've been able to track uh, visits to the wellness respite areas, 52,400 uh, on the last count. We've done over 5,700 wellness rounds, uh, but it, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to, to track a number of one-on-one uh, -on -one and group debriefs when people are too busy to, to enter it into the system. But we know many, many were happening. We know right daily in the emergency departments uh, multiple group debriefs are, are happening. Um, so Charles, do you want to talk about Office of Behavioral Health? Sorry, are you, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, so uh, thank you for allowing us to, to talk about this experience. Uh, as it has been one like none other we've experienced. The Office of Behavioral Health uh, as a service line was formed about five to six years ago. 
uh, during that time, as both chairs understand that oftentimes our patients in the behavioral health services may present challenges in management, uh, we began to uh, develop sort of the, the beginnings of what came, became H3 uh, at our facilities that uh, the staff sort of on their own wanted to support people who might have experienced trauma uh, in that, you know, both psychological trauma or physical trauma. Uh, so we began to form uh, in each of the facilities uh, a core group who would provide, voluntarily provide support uh, to anyone who had been through a bad experience. Uh, we also built on the experience we had with 9-11 uh, and Superstorm Sandy in the sense of providing support not only to the, within the uh, Department of Behavioral Health, but also within the, the hospitals that they served in. Uh, so this sort of became a rudimentary thing when, when Dr. Wei and Dr. Katz really wanted to be a much more formal program for the entire facility. Uh, our staff were certainly very happy and very eager to, to participate in, uh, and I think that's what um, helped us. And as Dr. Wei says, we like to look out after our own, so we're really in the business of supporting. Thank you. How do the programs handle moral injury from stressful medical decisions brought on by maybe the lack of equipment or the staffing? I may ask Eric to do a little more of that. I mean, whatever the the, the issue was, whether it was such a thing as the, the shortage of equipment that brought about stress or a moral dilemma, or whether it was from uh, seeing so much uh, sickness and illness and death, et cetera, I think that the staff had been, you know, through a, a, an enormous amount of like preparing and training uh, through the steering committee, through Mr. Siegel, through Dr. Lynn Walton, uh, and the chance to, to really prepare them for any option uh, of trauma that they were experiencing and still provide that support. It may be then that we would ask them if they wanted to go forward to some, maybe a specialist that, that specialized in that kind of trauma. Uh, and so it was on site and yet also uh, we extended other help for them. Are there any lessons learned from the implementation of triage guidelines? Um, yes, Eric, can I ask you to comment? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to, to take that. So I think from the, the moral injury uh, question as well as the triage guidelines, I think it was just the, the mere fact that we were discussing these things in the United States of America. U.S. doctors, nurses, healthcare workers are not trained to, to deal with these kinds of situations. We've always been able to do everything for everyone uh, who wants it. And uh, so I think just the, the fear, the, the mere fact that we were even talking about the potential of getting there where we would have to triage ventilators or oxygen or uh, uh, anything, anything else um, was extremely traumatizing. To, to myself, to other emergency physicians, ICU providers, to uh, you know, internal medicine doctors on the medical surgical wards. Uh, I am uh, similar to everyone else who has spoken um, so far, uh, extremely thankful that the social distancing measures, the stay at home, the masks, the, the six feet, prevented worst case scenario. We never got to where we had to triage ventilators or we had to triage who we do uh, CPR uh, on. But I think, right, the mere fact that that was in the back of everyone's mind and everybody was talking about, do we need to you know, implement these types of triage pro protocols and policies uh, that was traumatizing in itself. Um, and I think, uh, through any of our support services, if this is something that is bothering um, or uh, you know, traumatizing the staff member, this is what we talk about. And so through first peer support and then speaking to your colleagues about, I felt that way too, you know, is often enough, right? But if that's not enough, then we will kick it up to a tier three uh, mental health specialist uh, to provide some more professional kind of counseling uh, services, but um, I think it, it, 
one of many topics that was a common theme. If there's a second wave, how could we lessen the emotional strain on medical and non-medical staff? And can you go into a little bit more on, on how non-medical staff are informed about the programming? Mm -hmm. Only because in, in one of your remarks, I know you've mentioned across disciplines, which mm -hmm. that's an inherently medical response. So I just want to make sure that we're covering non-medical workers as well. Yeah, yeah. And so we are holding H3 debriefs um, with our central office uh, staff. Uh, so many are, are administrators, many are not clinical um, by, by background. Uh, we're working closely with our senior leadership, um, senior vice president for uh, facilities development, Christine Flaherty, uh, teaming up with us on how do we do H3 support for the trades, right? And uh, our senior vice president for uh, pharmacy and supply chain, how do we do H3 debriefs for the supply chain leads, right? And for uh, other kind of support services, EBS um, is under them as well. And so we are providing support there. We utilize our internal intranet. There's a newsletters that come out on a weekly basis uh, with resources. Uh, it is very prominent on the homepage. Anytime you open uh, Internet Explorer or Chrome uh, using an H&H &H computer. It's right there, right? COVID-19 resources, helping healers heal resources. Uh, and then we incorporate it into our uh, leadership huddles, our patient safety huddles um, that happen daily, right? Any sort of events that are brought up uh, from overnight or from the prior day uh, is almost like a standing Right? Do we need to activate H3 for, for that event and who was affected? And so that's how, how we reach out. Uh, on the question of the second wave, I think some of the, the lessons learned, um, I think uh, potentially um, rotating staff off of the, the front lines. And so um, the military does this. Uh, you know, soldiers can only be on the front lines of a battle for so long before, right, the emotional and psychological toll. Uh, and so um, if there is a way for us to rotate people out, even if they're, you know, still providing services, but not necessarily the ones intubating patients or, or receiving, you know, from EMS. Uh, so some sort of rotation um, out off of the, the front lines um, and uh, more of you know, the, West, the respite wellness rooms, uh, more of meeting people where they are, uh, and some of these, right, repurposing meetings, staff meetings, morning reports, grand rounds, educational meetings, to do these debriefs so that you can process it together with your colleagues. So aside, you know, I want to ask a little bit about that. I wanted to, what hospitals need to do to improve mental health beyond just providing some of these services. How is H&H &H providing time off and working to improve amount of PPE and beds and medical supplies? And how is H&H &H working to maintain proper staffing ratios? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, those are all uh, priorities for us and, and we're very um, proud of our supply chain team. Uh, this was not a New York City, this was not a New York City Health and Hospitals uh, crisis with the shortage of PPE. This was a global one. You saw hospitals in Italy struggling to get PPE in China, and Hong Kong, and all over the world. Uh, and our supply chain um, team worked you know, 18 hour days uh, tracking down every lead to get us hospital grade N95s and uh, other PPE uh, so that they weren't wearing, right, uh, KN95s and trash bags as, as PPE. Uh, so, right, did we, did we have severe anxiety about running out? Absolutely. The rest of the world did, every healthcare system in the hospital did, but we never came close to running out, uh, which we're very proud of. And we continue to fight for it. It's not like just because the surge moved past New York City, suddenly all the supply chain lines opened up. And so we're continuing to, to claw and fight um, to gain as much PPE as possible to stockpile 
in preparation for future surges um, there. Uh, for staffing, um, we uh, were excited to um, partner with NISNA and sign um, a, a new contract with safe uh, minimum nurse staffing uh, ratios as, as part of it. And uh, Natalia Sineas, our um, chief nursing executive, uh, is working very closely with all the CNOs of our facilities to get us there um, to, to meet those staffing models. Uh, but it is something, right, we uh, absolutely refuse to run a healthcare system that we would not be proud to bring our own children. I bring my own children to New York City Health and Hospitals. My wife and I actually delivered our, our third child at Bellevue Hospital three weeks before I had to go into isolation and hiding um, because of uh, working ED shifts and going into these hot zones. And so very proud that uh, I work for a health system that I bring my own family to. And, and, um, and so that's, that's what we're staffing to and that's what we uh, hold ourselves to. I, I was also born in Bellevue, so I think it's okay. a, great, a great place. Okay. Yes. So I, I just wanted, you know, cause I, I have spoken to uh, advocates and of course labor and I know that the agreement that you have with NISA does really reflect the situation that occurred during COVID and I realized it was an unprecedented time and you said there were shortages all over the world and I have looked at strategies and things in, in Singapore and Wuhan and in cities in Italy and Canada and Illinois and Hawaii and Iowa and Virginia and California just to see if we can learn from other places so, you know, because of the stress that happened um, during COVID, uh, you know, I just want to ask a, a couple questions. One was there was a Wall Street Journal investigation that highlighted uh, this kind of situation and these conditions as an issue. So how many traveling nurses and medical staff were brought on at h, &H at the height of the pandemic? Um. I don't have that exact number uh, in front of me because we we did bring, um, so one was the military. We had Navy, Army, Air Force, uh, medical personnel in our uh, facilities. And we also uh, had FEMA as well as direct vendor uh, staff come in. Um, I'm gonna have to get back to you on the exact numbers because I don't want to give uh, incorrect data on it. Uh, but we certainly did bring a, a whole lot of nursing and uh, uh, physician staffing in, um, and that allowed us to right, triple our critical care capacity um, across the system, as well as staff up for uh, our hotel program, um, as well as the uh, Billie Jean King uh, Field Hospital. And so um, I will have to get back to you on the exact numbers. Um, yes. I know we were very aggressive. I know, I know. And, I, and I've taken a lot of time to ask questions. So that's why I want to wrap up and give my colleagues a minute. Um, the reason why I ask is because it, it, it got to a point where the conditions were really, really dire. And many of the hospital staff actually spoke out via social media, via the press. And I know that there were some issues uh, pertaining to, to speaking with the press and some of the uh, whistleblower policies, and I hope that, um, you know, as, as Dr. Katz mentioned, that you do support people speaking out and making sure that some of those conditions were brought to light. But if you're making a commitment to rotate medical staff more quickly off front lines in a future wave, how many traveling or temp staff will you need to have ready to bring on to do that effectively? Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea in terms of preparation? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't give you an exact number for it, but what we did, um, uh, which I, I, I think was um, critical, uh, is that we know that not every borough and not every community was equally hit. This disproportionately hit the poorest, the most vulnerable um, in our minority uh, communities and, and populations. And so Elmhurst and Queens hospitals are an example of this. Uh, and it wasn't like, FDNY could just bring patients to Jamaica uh, or Flushing um, because they were in the same borough and they were equally hit um, as hard. And so uh, not allowing one hospital, one facility, one staff to drown under the weight of the COVID surge, 
uh, meant that we had to shift resources towards those hospitals, uh, whether that be personnel, whether that be uh, ventilators, um, anything else that they needed, uh, as well as level loading patients across the system. Um, uh, Manhattan, we know, was less affected um, given, you know, more kind of affluence and, and uh, more ability to, to isolate and socially distance. Uh, and so rather than having our Manhattan hospital sitting by idly, uh, helping um, to carry some of the, the weight uh, was very important to save lives. Um, I think right from, from the Wall Street Journal uh, article, uh, I think, you know, we'll, we'll never uh, dispute um, people's uh, lived experience and their perspectives. We respect our, our workers too much for that. We are never going to um, uh, say that they can't speak out to the press. And that, that's why um, uh, you might see more of them speaking out to the press because we, we do not retaliate uh, against them. Um, and uh, you know, I think all those things are, are, are lessons learned for us. Um, we do uh, feel proud about, you know, everything that we did to save lives. Um, and we did it uh, right under the gun um, and extreme pressure. And uh, right, our, our frontline staff, um, I don't think heroes is, is a is strong enough word. Um, and I'm so proud to be a healthcare worker. Uh, and to be in New York City um, through this. Uh, and so um, I think lessons learned all around and, and uh, um, you know, we're very proud of, of our, our staff and our system. And thank you. We are very, very proud of you as well. So we have a tremendous debt, but um, if, if you can get us the numbers afterwards and and I thank you for covering all of that because we want to make sure that people feel confident in getting help um, and that there's no fear of retaliation, that they get the, all the services that they need. Um, and I just want to, you know, I think Dr. Wendy Dean, who I believe is, is here to testify today, I think she said it uh, very concisely that there is no doubt this pandemic will mark many Americans with psychological scars, but how big, how complex, and how much they will interfere with the function of healthcare workers will depend on how organizations respond to this newly erupting phase of the crisis. So we are happy to be partners with you um, and making sure that people get the services and help that they need in the language that they are most comfortable regardless of their position. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chairwoman, for the time. Thank you. Did anyone else sign up for a question? Let me just, I'm sorry, let me just double check. Is that Mark Levine over there trying to get in? I'm from Emma Levine. Well, thank you so much, Chairs Ayala and Rivera for this excellent hearing. Um, and great to see our friends from h and I'm wondering about the health insurance that employees have, you know, insurance companies have been notoriously bad at covering behavioral health or mental health services. We all believe they should be covered to the full extent that any health problem is. They're not often. Uh, could you talk to us about the co-pays required for mental health services under the insurance plan that your staff have? Um, how broad the network of coverage is? Um, and, and just how, how well served their insurance company, how well served they are by their insurance coverage when it comes to mental health needs. Sure, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for that question. Um, I'll start and then I'll ask uh, Charles to, to add to it. Um, so New York City Health and Hospital staff uh, are eligible to all the city plans um, that are avail available to, to all New York City uh, workers. Um, sorry, does that include, sorry, Dr. Wade, does that include part-timers as well? Part-time staff? Uh, that, I'm not sure what percentage of time uh, or FTE you would need to be to be eligible for it. So I'll have to get back to you on that. But certainly our, our full-time uh, staff are eligible uh, to it. There are three free plans, Blue Cross, GHI, uh, CBP plan, 
the HIP HMO plan as well as Metro Plus, but there is a long list. There's Aetna, Cigna, Empire, uh, uh, other GHI, other HIP, uh, Metro Plus Gold, um, which I have, Vitra um, are some of the, the insurance um, plans that are available. Uh, we do have a lot of our um, providers, our physicians are paid by affiliates. Um, so NYU for Bellevue, Mount Sinai for Elmhurst, um, Pagni for many of our, our sites. And so their kind of menu of, of health plans varies depending on you know what's available to Mount Sinai staff, what's available to NYU staff, and then uh, Pagni has its own list. Each of these do have uh, coverage for, for behavioral health. Uh, I don't know the, the details of what a copay for any of these, right, 10 plus uh, plans are. Um, but Charles, do you have anything to, to add to that? Charles, I think you're on mute. Thank you, sorry. Uh, technologically challenged. Uh, so I don't also know the uh, co-pays for these, but uh, that they're relatively minimal. Uh, one of the things that behavioral health and health and hospitals as a system has been uh, in support of is, is parity for behavioral health, mental health, substance use services, uh, along with the physical uh, illness benefits. Uh, there have been recent legislation that has been passed uh, that helps helps that, but we still actually join with many of the advocacy groups uh, to uh, really try to make sure that all of our employees uh, or anyone uh, is able to have the equal care for behavioral health services that you might get for physical care services. And we will continue to advocate for that till we're successful. Okay, please, please do. This is very important. Just one more question. Patients also have mental health needs. Um, I mean, what they went through with COVID in March and April, um, in many cases, uh, patients confronting this illness without the comfort of family members there uh, probably meant that staff often had to play the role of therapist or provide mental health services um, when patients themselves were facing challenges. And I'm, I'm wondering to the extent that we have enough uh, in-house mental health staff to carry that burden so that um, frontline medical staff are not put into the position of having to, to be therapists to patients in need, which also would be a burden on the frontline medical staff. Certainly, um, we are very aware of the the challenges that faced uh, people with existing mental illnesses or substance use services, and those that were going to develop uh, mental health or mental health issues uh, during this very challenging time Hi. of isolation, uh, absence for our families. So uh, we were very pre uh, prepared. We geared up and prepared more, uh, and are expecting you know post-COVID uh, continued mental health needs for our communities. Uh, our staff are well trained uh, in crisis management. Uh, we have given them additional trainings uh, in crisis management and trauma uh, care. Uh, we provided uh, services via uh, telehealth, uh, especially telephonic for patients uh, to make sure that they continue to have contact with uh, support uh, and the outside. and follow-up issues. We did see patients in the house that were crisis done, but the majority of our services were, were telehealth, televisual, uh, and telephonic, and we actually found that the percentage of people who uh, participated, you know, kept their appointments via telephone uh, was significantly increased. Uh, it's a, it was a vital way of making sure that people stayed in contact, uh, were stable, and very much alerted us to uh, any kind of acute needs that they had in which we dispensed our mobile crisis units or our other community-based uh, units to go in and try to have uh, more close contact with them face-to-face -face with PPE. Uh, we also participated in most of the hospitals in on the medical services for the uh, acutely ill and the ICUs, on ventilators, et cetera, 
of working with families uh, who felt uh, isolated from the, the patient in the house and the, and the patients in the house being isolated from not having visitors from their family. Uh, we used technology for that. We used uh, iPads uh, and other devices to uh, have video visits with their family uh, and make sure that they could stay in touch and be supported by their families uh, as well. Uh, any months of team wants to add, add into that? Yeah, I think uh, the the fact that COVID-19 led to uh, no visitation to, to protect both the uh, visitors, patients, um, and staff was probably one of the most heartbreaking uh, uh, parts of this pandemic. Um, and uh, we just want um, families uh, in the community to know uh, that our empathetic healthcare workers did step up and they became the family members. Nobody died alone. Uh, and, and not only the connecting family through the video visits, uh, but it was our nurses, it was our volunteers, it was our respiratory therapists and our, our physicians who were there holding hands uh, there at the last moment. Um, and so uh, certainly uh, one of the most heartbreaking parts of this. Yes, no doubt. And heartbreaking for patients and families, but the theme of this hearing today is the impact on staff. And, and we know that also was heartbreaking for staff to go through yes. those difficult months. And, um, and we also know that this is gonna be a long-term fight that in some ways the hardest struggle is post-trauma mm -hmm. when the adrenaline stops and um, that's when often PTSD sets in. And, and so, we encourage you to keep up the work on this as long as it takes, and that may be years to come, um, to care for the staff um, who have been through so much already. Anyway, I want to thank you for that, uh, those responses, and I'll pass it back to our chairs. Thanks to both of you as well. Thank you. Um, just want to, so we wanted to just thank the administration for being here today to testify. And that concludes that this part of the, the hearing. I'm now going to pass it over to our moderator who's going to call on the public for testimony, unless there's another member that forgot to raise their hand to speak. Seeing none, we will go to the moderator. Thank you, Chair Ayala. We have concluded administration testimony and will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that after the first panelist, individuals will be called up in a panel of three or four. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. The first panelist will be Jenna Mandel Ricci from the Greater New York Hospital Association. Time begins now, Jenna. Thank you. And thank you so much to all of my Health and Hospitals colleagues that just presented. Uh, Chair Rivera, Chair Ayala, and members of the Committee on Hospitals and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. My name is Jenna Mandel Ricci. I'm a Vice President of Regulatory and Professional Affairs at the Greater New York Hospital Association. GNYHA proudly represents all hospitals in New York City, both not-for-profit and public, as well as hospitals throughout New York State, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. During normal times, I lead GNYHA's efforts related to emergency preparedness and employee well-being. However, for the past several months, I've served as the incident commander for our COVID-19 response. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Today, I will discuss the constellation of employee health and wellness resources and structures that hospitals generally use to support their workforce, how hospitals quickly pivoted and amplified these resources to meet the acute needs of the workforce during the COVID-19 patient surge and current GNYHA initiatives to support ongoing workforce well-being. Hospitals have long prioritized the safety, health, and well-being of their workers. 
Hospitals throughout our membership have established employee wellness programs that seek to address areas such as nutrition, physical activity, stress management, and chronic disease prevention and management. GNYHA helps members develop and continuously improve employee health and well being programs. Since 2015, our wellness work group has brought together GNYHA members to share best practices and discuss emerging issues. Last year, GNYHA also formed a clinician well being advisory group. This group of healthcare leaders focuses exclusively on the issues faced by frontline providers. In March, as COVID 19 advanced across the globe and the patient first patients began arriving at New York City hospitals, our members quickly pivoted and amplified their existing health and well-being structures to meet the physical and emotional needs of their staff. Hospitals and health systems prioritize meeting the basic needs of employees to reduce stress and allow them to focus on patient and self-care. For example, Mount Sinai Health System created a web page for staff that outlined resources for employees seeking help with food, transportation, childcare, and other basic needs. To reduce confusion and fear and to help ensure accurate messaging, hospitals and health systems prioritize frequent communication to employees. For example, the Montefiore Health System president and CEO led daily Montefiore Together phone calls for all health system staff. And while hospitals and health systems prioritize the mental health of all staff during the COVID-19 crisis, they paid special attention to frontline healthcare workers treating severely ill COVID-19 patients. For example, New York Presbyterian at Columbia prepared a guidance document on how to conduct small group debriefing sessions focused on coping strategies. As the patient surge decreased, hospitals began focusing on the intermediate mental health impacts on their workforce. With an emphasis on normalizing feelings of anxiety, stress, right. and grief, thank you, providing staff members with strategies and opportunities for self-care and access to counseling services. GNYHA is actively supporting member hospitals through a number of initiatives, some of which you've already heard about today, including Hero New York, and I can mention others during questions if you like. New York City's frontline healthcare workers accomplished the extraordinary during the COVID-19 patient surge. As they process the grief and anxiety of that experience, they also face an uncertain world of living and working in an ongoing pandemic and social upheaval. GNYHA and our members intend to support them so that they can thrive during these difficult times. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this critically important issue, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to remind council members who have questions for particular panelists to use the raised hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after the panel has completed its testimony and in the order in which you raise your hand. Are there any Council member questions? Uh, Chair Rivera, please go ahead. Hi, yes, thank you so much for being here. I just wanted to ask um, about some of the, particularly about the HERO program. I wanted to ask how many hospitals have taken part in the Train the Trainers program. I'm, I'm assuming all of them have some version of the program, if not that exactly. And who participates? How are you making it available in some of the voluntary hospitals? And if you could just give us a, a little bit more, some more details on how you're promoting the program and how you're making sure that every level of, of position uh, feels comfortable in accessing services. Can you hear me now? I was having a little trouble getting unmuted. Thank you for the question, Chair Rivera. So we have made the Hero New York program available to our entire membership. I see your dog in the background. You have a very cute dog. Um, to our entire membership that includes New York City and beyond. I can't give you exact numbers of how many of our member hospitals are currently participating, but I can certainly get that information and share it with you. We have made this, uh, we have promoted the program in a number of ways. I mentioned in my testimony that we have a wellness work group and a clinician well-being advisory group. 
during meetings with those groups, we have heavily talked about and promoted the HERO New York program. As well, we have sort of regular communications that we push out to our membership. So we had special bulletins that went out about it. And you heard Dr. Wei report earlier that we had over 700 participants on the first training on June 3rd, and we had nearly 600 at the second one on June 10th. And we are recording all of the information so that if there are any members who sort of didn't get word until it was already beginning, that they can go back and catch themselves up. And we do plan as part of the last of the series of five and following that to check in with all of our members around implementation. But how is the, the cross-sharing in terms of resources with the public hospital versus the others kind of in the, in the membership of the Greater New York Hospital Association? Or I know that Dr. Way specifically spoke to some of his experiences um, in h and but I think what we saw kind of during the beginning of the pandemic was this real need for there to be one system. And eventually there was an announcement made to the public, but we, we were trying to get more information on, on how you were really all supporting each other. So it was, a little, it was a little bit difficult for us. So I'd like to hear about how that's happening now in terms of how you're taking care of workers equitably, regardless of which hospital they work in in New York City. Sure. So GNYHA is a membership organization. So all of the hospitals within New York City are our members. So that includes health and hospitals, plus all of the volunteers. And then we have many members outside of New York City. And we make all of our resources and all of our programming available to everyone. So there's really no distinction in our minds between a public hospital and a voluntary hospital. And I work day to day on emergency preparedness and emergency response. And we have excellent relationships with all of our hospitals and they have excellent relationships with each other. So among, for example, the emergency management community, there's already an incredible level of trust and collaboration. As, as one example, since before 2000 in preparation for Y2K, if you can think back that far, we have been holding a monthly emergency preparedness coordinating council that brings together emergency managers from hospitals across the region, along with agency partners. So month in and month out, year over year, we work on emerging issues and problems together. So there's a really solid level of collaboration that then extends into emergency response. Is the council different from the clinician well-being advisory group that was formed last year? Yes. Yes, so I work in two principal areas. I work on emergency preparedness and then employee wellness, kind of an odd pairing, but they do come together at certain times like now. Um, so the emergency preparedness coordinating council is a separate council that we have been running again for 20 years that specifically deals with emergency preparedness. While the clinician wellbeing advisory council was something that formed out of a lot of work that we've been doing over the last couple of years related to clinician burnout and resilience and a lot of the issues that you heard Dr. Wei talk about so eloquently a few minutes ago. So this was foundational work that was already happening that was looking to address issues like second victimhood and just the ongoing stresses of working in healthcare. So that was a group that had already formed and then we've really activated it and utilized it during the current COVID crisis. And, and just my last question, I know we're, we're speaking on the, the frontline uh, staff, but I wanted to just go back to my mention on equity because mental health services in the United States tend to be based in westernized ideals. So how does the HERO and Y program ensure it meets the needs of marginalized communities, specifically the communities of color that were so disproportionately affected? And how do people know that the programming will meet their needs? So it's important to understand that Hero New York is really about providing additional training to behavioral health and human resources and other providers that will then be providing those services to staff. So this is really a train the trainer model and it's about increasing the capacity and skill levels of folks that then provide services. So what I imagine will happen is that as individuals go through this training, they will then take this information back and think about how best to apply it to their own workforce and the unique needs of that workforce. 
I'm going to actually just defer to. Um, all right. So let me just ask you real quick about the safe staffing that I ask H and H. Do you think that the overwhelming situation that doctors and nurses face during COVID, which have already been a problem in EDs across the department, change Greater New York's position on the need for safe staffing? To be totally honest, that's really not an area of expertise of mine, so I don't feel comfortable answering that question, but I certainly can go back to my colleagues and get back to you. Is that because you said your title was incident commander? Uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, I've been the incident commander, but day to day, the two areas that I work on are emergency preparedness and then employee wellness. All right, and you don't feel comfortable answering about safe staffing. Okay, no. I'm gonna turn to my, uh, colleagues and, and see if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Council Member Ravel did a really wonderful job of asking. One of the questions that I wanted to ask, <laughs> so I'm not gonna, I don't, I don't wanna, I have two, two follow-ups though. So. Um, one is the language appropriateness of in, in which the services are being rendered. Can you guys hear me well? Cause somebody's saying that it sounds really low. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so really the question is about language and what, what language are these programs uh, being provided in? So Chair Ayala, I can't speak to specific programs. The Hero New York program, which again is a train the trainer program is being conducted in English. But again, the idea here is that we are investing and in increasing the skills and capacity of behavioral health professionals, of folks that work in HR or work on employee wellness, and then they're going to take this back to their institution and implement these skills and programs and layer them into what they already offer. I am quite certain that our hospitals provide services to their workforce in the languages that those individuals are comfortable in. And again, there's really, you heard Dr. Lynn Walton from h, &H talk about the, the no wrong door policy. I think it's fair to say that most of our hospitals and our membership offer many, many, many different kinds of mental health resources because you never know how someone wants to access those resources. Do they want to use an app? Do they want to talk to a counselor on site? Do they want to go through their health insurance? Do they want to call a helpline? So it's really about providing them with the information so that they can access services in the way that they're most comfortable with in the language that they prefer. Absolutely. Does Greater New York refer to Well NYC? Do you use that as a resource as well? So we don't do direct service. We provide services to our hospital members, but I am certain that all of our hospitals that are located in New York City within their resources that they make available to staff include NYC well. Okay, and that, uh, that's my final question. So is, is uh, the people within the hospital are gonna be heading up these programs. How do we ensure that they themselves receive the care that they need after experiencing this pandemic? I think that's a great question. Um, in all of the work that we do with our member hospitals, we really emphasize, as you heard my H&H &H colleagues talk about, the need for everyone within the health system to have the opportunity for services. And I do know, I am not a behavioral health specialist, but I do know within the behavioral health world, there's a real emphasis on the individuals who provide the care also having access to the care that they need because they take on a very large burden helping others and they too can become second victims. So I believe that that is something that in any behavioral health program that that supervision and that um, provision of care for the healers is also part of it, if that's Absolutely. helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, a reminder, um, if any, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand in Zoom. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the first panelist with that and move on to the next panel. The second panel in order of speaking will be Dr. Wendy Dean, Dr. James Cho, and Judith Cutchin. I will now call on Dr. Wendy Dean. 
Time begins now. Thank you, council members. Um, I'm Wendy Dean from the Moral Injury of Healthcare. And I would like to thank the chairs and members of the New York City Count Committees on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction and Hospitals for the opportunity to submit this testimony about New York City Hospital's response to the mental health needs of frontline healthcare workers during the coronavirus pandemic. We are a nonprofit dedicated to addressing clinician distress. And I commend the council for attending to the psychological recovery of frontline staff in the wake of the initial COVID surge and for bolstering psychological readiness for a second, a potential second wave of the virus. As Councilman Rivera mentioned in her opening comments, distress, whether moral injury or burnout, was rampant among clinicians before the surge happened. Suicide rates among healthcare professionals was unacceptably high. COVID-19 magnified many of the pre-existing challenges and it added new ones. As described earlier, the conditions in New York hospitals during the peak of the initial surge were like nothing most of us have seen in our lifetimes in Western healthcare. And it has left many deeply concerned about the long-term psychological well-being of New York City hospital staff. As with any crisis, when the pressure to act subsides, when there's time to breathe, as so many clinician friends say, the pressure to feel intensifies. Each will process his or her intense emotions and experiences in unique ways on a unique timeline. That grief does not resolve at our bidding. Organizations may face some challenges in providing support for psychological recovery of their frontline workers. As Dr. Wade described, many clinicians are reluctant to seek help for mental health concerns. And there's a habit among those who work in healthcare to minimize their own needs in the face of greater perceived suffering by patients and families. It's a part of a culture steeped in self-sacrifice and deeply uncomfortable with personal vulnerability. In part, that vulnerability is bred by the, the brittle distrust, the brittleness of trust between workers and organizations prior to COVID. Nevertheless, it's critical that healthcare systems in New York make a concerted effort to acknowledge the losses, grief, and trauma their workers experience, experienced. Health hospital staff is the most valuable asset and the most expensive, expensive resource for a healthcare organization, and taking good care of them is in their best interest. So I would have five recommendations. The first is to ease up and to staff at maximal optimal levels, including 110% as suggested for ER staffing, which is often not met because of financial concerns. Um, check in and mean it, show up in person. Leadership needs to show up in person, being genuinely interested in what workers need and making those resources simple to get. Provide support. Um, Peer support can be exceptionally helpful for some, but other options which do not burden the frontline workers with providing their own healing should be equally available. And it may be possible for healthcare organizations across the city to come together and collaboratively provide um, an option that is outside of each of their institutions. Um, I would also, I'm sorry, was that time? Uh, the third is to beware of appropriating the hero. Um, healthcare organizations and other agencies may want to reconsider referring to frontline workers as heroes. Instead, get them the equipment they need to do their jobs and stay safe. Um, prepare for a long tail of need. Psychological recovery may take two years or longer, and um, responses must be long-term, flexible, and convenient. The fifth is to learn lessons. Triage isn't practiced, rationing isn't discussed, and that must change. Um, many frontline workers have had experience they're unprepared for, which will have prolonged impact. It's the respectable response. It's the respectful, responsible, and compassionate thing to do to support their psychological recovery and to ensure psychological readiness for a potential second wave of coronavirus. Um, I applaud you for having the courage to confront these complex challenges, and your. I would say that the leadership of the New York City committees. Um, can forge a path for others to follow. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Dr. James Cho. Time begins.
Dr. James Cho, please proceed. We just can't hear you, Dr. Cho, I'm sorry. You're not on mute, but we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I hear you now, time begins. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> hello and thank you, um, Chair Ayala, Chair Rivera, and the City Council members present today. Uh, my name is James Cho, and I'm a primary care physician and hospitalist of internal medicine at Bellevue Hospital. So I'm here today to represent just the individual healthcare worker rather than representing our hospital. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I speak from the perspective of someone that's worked uh, in the adult primary care clinic and the hospital wards of Bellevue for over a decade, uh, but also staffing the hospital in March and April as our city braced for the worst of this COVID surge. And I shared in the care of the sickest patients in the hospital as our, fa our city faced looming shortages of ventilator supplies, hospital beds, while we saw colleagues going out uh, each week with illness, while we saw the mortality rates rapidly rise to levels beyond anything we could have imagined. And I also speak uh, with the perspective of a primary care physician who is now engaged in the evolving pivot to telehealth and telemedicine as we try to re-engage our community in primary care, a community which at Bellevue includes the most vulnerable populations of our city, many of whom are constituents of your districts, as well as um, the city residents that have been most affected by this pandemic. And I won't share with you today some of the worst patient stories that will probably stay with me for the remainder of my career, but instead I wanted to share some of the feelings I had during the past few months as I worked in the hospital. I remember vividly the feeling of helplessness as I saw my elderly patients slip into depression and delirium while struggling to breathe in the hospital bed away from loved ones. I remember uh, resentment I felt as we made daily compromises uh, to the fundamental aspect of being a healthcare worker, the ability to comfort in times of distress, which no longer included the ability to sit at a patient's bedside or to offer a comfort of touch as our patients suffered in isolation from their family. Instead, too often we spoke, over, uh, spoke by phone over the sounds of hissing oxygen and faced each other through glass windows or a rapidly fogging face shield and mask. I also remember a feeling of horror as I imagined the patient's experience of dying in the hospital surrounded by blue gowns, never even having seen our faces behind the mask. Now as I return to primary care, I at times also feel ineffective as I speak with some of my patients who have been enrolled in a contact tracing program that doesn't offer information or transparency to the providers of the city. At times I feel helpless as I struggle through basic patient care tasks without an established workspace, without appropriate conferencing tools, or even access to a fax machine, which is an outdated tool, but uh, that stubbornly clings to the rel to revel uh, revel relevancy in our, our, the world of healthcare. I share with you some of these feelings to illustrate what I believe is among the biggest challenges for frontline workers. It's facing um, the loss of our professional identity as providing comfort to our patients. Uh, we have support systems as described by Dr. Wei and the Health and Hospitals team for promoting. Is it okay if he finishes his thought? Yeah. Um, we have these support systems to help uh, through the coping, but I think we need to reframe some of uh, the experiences that healthcare workers are having about um, the, the loss of our professional roles. We need uh, support systems for regular and real-time communication with our leadership to express uh, our experiences and navigate the operational challenges. And we really need to reinforce just our, the support of our workspaces, the basic essentials of space, uh, access to uh, 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 water, snacks, food, um, just like very basic and essential needs that we have on a daily basis as we continue in our roles as healthcare providers. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to participate in the hearing and offer my testimony for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Judith Hutchins. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Judith Cutchin. I'm from the New York State Nurses Association. I am the president of the New York City Health and Hospital Executive Council and mayoral agency representing over 9,000 public sector nurses. I sit on the NISNA Board of Directors. I am also a registered nurse in health and hospitals for 30, oh, 30 years. Um, I, I currently work at Woodhall. I'm also an H3 
three peer supporter at Woodhall Hospital. I would like to thank Hospital Committee Chair Carlina Rivera, Chair Ayala, and committee members for their work on this critical issue. New York City Hospital's response to mental health needs of frontline healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And during the COVID um, pandemic, the shortages took a toll on mental health of our frontline workers. Many workers uh, work endless hours, losing patients in situations out of control. Others struggled with taking time to care for themselves when they themselves received their own diagnosis. There was a burden of possibly exposing their own family members as well. The instant lifestyle change, isolation from family and friends, financial hardship also took an emotional toll on our frontline workers. I would like to thank health and hospitals for implementing the H three um, helping healers heal program that's offering the frontline workers direct care um, to be able to have the opportunity to talk, which was therapeutic for each and every person. The, if the wellness rounds are amazing at each facility also identifying symptoms of anxiety and depression. Expanding these types of programs to all frontline workers is critical at this time. The New York State Nurses Association is the organization of reg registered frontline workers. Our nurse, our nurse members also have access to 24-hour behavioral health helpline through our union assistant program. We, offer, we also offer member-to-member -member, um, support. Uh, during the COVID-19, um, NYSA created our own virtual wellness round. This also helps us to identify anxiety and depression. These were done in weekly town hall meetings where the members discuss issues and share. We also have follow-up meetings um, in case we need to revisit issues. We also recommend the opportunity for our members to have spiritual healing. So this will also help with the spiritual well-being. Each of our sessions are over 100 members, which is great. Um, we expanded our newsletters, our Facebook, um, or our Twitter account just to allow the members to expand on the COVID-19 story. But we would like to see that for all New York City hospitals to have such programs to address mental health needs of all healthcare workers and their families during this um, trying time that we are in this um, pandemic. I would again like to thank you again for your time and your commitment on this very important issue. Thanks, and I'm happy to partner with any um, organization in this matter. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Again, a reminder, uh, if any council members have any questions, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. No. Chair Rivera, or Chair Ayala. No, I have a question. Um, actually, my question, I have two questions. One for Judith um, regarding the, uh, the the level of, of, of delivery of service. I'm just wondering, you know, what your perspective was, was on, you know, how, effect, how, how prepared do you think that you um, that you were, you know, in the midst of the, of the pandemic. And uh, I mean, it sounds like, like, like members are already afforded a multitude of opportunities to connect to mental health services, but did you find that that was adequate? Did you find that there were, you know, holes within that system that didn't work for you well? Um, so, um, I believe um, these programs were effective and allowing, you know, coupling with H and H and the New York State Nurses Association program, I believe it was effective. I did get feedback um, from members that it was very helpful, um, that they were able to vent, they were able to get a lot of things off their mind that they generally wouldn't talk um, regularly. A lot of our healthcare workers, you know, as healthcare workers, we tend to hold things in and not communicate um, issues with mental health has to be recognized, and I think these programs would, would serve the purpose. Thank you, because I'm one of them. Um, all of our nurses, who I know, um, work tirelessly. Um, and my, my follow-up question is to Dr. Um, so the, regarding, I, I wanted to just get your perspective on the Helping the Healers uh, Heal program, and wondering if that was a, a tool that you found uh, to be useful. To be honest, um, I have not. Um, engaged or participated in that program. Um, I 
Um, I'm familiar with the program since it had launched uh, because they were eliciting uh, participants to uh, complete the training to be uh, facilitators, but I had never, um, I never had the clinical time to join uh, the sessions, and um, I think we as providers uh, largely have uh, utilized our, our own group and resources within our group, um, and I don't have experience with the Helping Healer Skill Program. So did you not? I mean, did you find it difficult to participate because of the overwhelming demand in the midst of the pandemic, or you know, were hours just not, you know, what did they not tailor it in a way that made it easier for frontline workers um, to access those services during the off time? I think, uh, as in terms of a physician, I think my perspective is more that it's. Uh, somewhat of a one-size-fits-all approach, and um, I don't. I, I just it wasn't apparent to me specifically um, what service I was seeking uh, through uh, helping healers heal or what activity. Um, and we we actually, uh, my group had a, a big focus on wellness to begin with, um, so the, that was largely what we relied on through um, the, the the crisis. That's helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. You're okay. I'm gonna. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I, I just, yeah, I wanted to just follow up in terms of generally how can we improve access to meaningful mental health programming? And for example, Dr. Dean, you mentioned that peer support works sometimes, right? And that there's also a need to collaborate. I was trying to ask Greater New York Hospital Association, you know, to shed some light on how they're collaborating. Um, I don't, I don't really feel like the question was answered, but um, I'm just curious from you all who are doing this from an advocate's perspective, and what what you're seeing and hearing from your colleagues, what we can do to just do more to help frontline hospital workers. So from my from my perspective, um, from what I've heard, because I'm an outsider, I think people feel more comfortable talking to me. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've heard is that a lot of people feel uncomfortable, distrustful, um, like their jobs might be at risk or like their confidential information could get out. Whether that's a reasonable concern or not isn't ours to say if they don't feel comfortable using the service because it's sponsored or part of their organization um, they don't have access to care. And so finding a way for people to get care outside of their own system may be very helpful. I guess the, the, my question is whether right, frontline workers have sufficient provider choice with respect to mental health services and their health plan networks. So I'm not really sure, you know, kind of what the, the diversity is in terms of offering, but I'm very, very interested in, in working with you all and figuring out how we can boost what is available and, and potentially incorporate some outside resources if, in case someone does feel uncomfortable um, addressing some of their issues internally in terms of peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so I just wanted to, to thank you all and, and I hope that as we reopen, which is gonna be the subject of my next hearing that perhaps we can all kind of come together in a sort of round table and, and take some of your recommendations uh, to heart. Thank you. Can I make one comment to that last um, uh, statement? Um, the, uh, to some extent, uh, seeking individual providers or individual health or mental health providers does fill a certain role for certain individuals. But a lot of us, I, uh, if you initiate contact with a behavioral health provider, just even the lack of that shared experience through what we've been through um, and trying to explain that experience is, is a, a hurdle. And I'm not sure, uh, I know that uh, peer support groups and kind of just uh, space to discuss with some of our colleagues is uh, one aspect of, of healing. I don't know, I'm sure some people do need some individual behavioral health therapy. But it, it, it's not a simple thing of like each person just needs to be matched with a behavioral health provider uh, because of some of the 
the nuances to the trauma that we've experienced. And I will also say that um, as providers, we are always seeing uh, needs in our patients and responding to that. And so when some of our uh, operational needs are not met in our day-to-day uh, professional role, sometimes we, we just uh, lack that time to reflect on our personal needs still, even though some of the worst of COVID is behind us. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, for taking the time, and for all your work at Bellevue. Thank you. Thank you. For the next and final panel, I will now call on Carla Lopez. Ms. Lopez? Time begins now. Good afternoon. Thank you to Chair Zayala and Rivera for holding this important hearing on the mental health needs of frontier healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Carla Lopez, and I'm the supervising attorney Community Health Access to Addiction and Mental Health Care Project, known as CHAMP, at the Community Service Society of New York. New York City's healthcare workers have spent the last three months laboring at the epicenter of the COVID-19 global pandemic, a traumatic and exhausting experience that inevitably will have consequences for their mental and physical health. Insurance should not be a barrier to seeking care and receiving mental health care, and yet it too often is. CHAMP can help. In 2018, the New York State Legislature established an independent statewide ombudsman program known as CHAMP. The CHAMP program is designed to help consumers and providers with health insurance coverage for substance use disorder and mental health services and is overseen by the State Office of Addiction Supports and Services and Office of Mental Health. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Community Service Society and not on behalf of OASIS, OMH, or our other CHAMP partners. For more than a decade, both New York State and federal lawmakers have recognized that discrimination by health insurers has made accessing mental health and substance use disorder care far more difficult than accessing other types of health care. Between 2006 and 2019, New York State and federal government passed a number of laws requiring most health insurers to cover mental health and substance use disorder care at parity with other types of medical care in order to address these disparities. Yet the data show that successfully using insurance coverage to access substance use disorder and mental health care remains unduly challenging. CHAMP's mission is to address these disparities so that New Yorkers can get the insurance coverage for the substance use disorder and mental health care that they need and have the right to receive. CHAMP helps clients regardless of their insurance type or status. The most common reason that clients seek CHAMP services is for help accessing care. These cases include issues like finding an in-network mental health provider, seeking reimbursement for services received from an out-of-network mental health provider, getting insurance coverage for mental health medications, and appealing denials of mental health services. Since the COVID-19 pandemic hit New York, CHAMP has seen a 58% increase in the proportion of cases where clients need help accessing mental health or substance use disorder care. Other issues that CHAMP clients commonly need help with include eligibility for insurance coverage, affording the cost of mental health care, and understanding how to use their health insurance. CHAMP also files complaints with plans and regulators about systemic issues such as violations of federal and state parity laws and reports these issues to OASIS and OMH. CHAMP stands ready to help our healthcare workers and all New Yorkers get insurance coverage for mental health and substance use disorder services. CHAMP's free helpline is open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and can be reached at 1-888-614 5,400. Thank you for your time. Hi, Carla. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I have just one question. Um, how are healthcare workers um, able to access information about these, these services? How, how, do you, how do you make them aware that they exist? We contract uh, with, subcontract with three specialist organizations and five CBOs throughout the state. And all of those organizations are contracted to conduct outreach and education to get the word out about CHAMP. Um, we're also going to be launching a social media campaign in the next couple of days to continue to get the word out. Um, and we'd be happy to do any specific outreach that, um, that any of you think would be helpful as well. Did you see? Did you see a surge in the number of people that were uh, reaching out during the pandemic? Did you ask whether we saw an increase? Yes. 
Um, we saw an increase in the number of people reaching out through our live answer helpline and then a decrease in the people who were going in person for help to the community-based organizations that we subcontract with. What are the significant increase? The numbers were not as significant as the change in what people were seeking help with, um, which as I mentioned was a 58% increase in the number of people who needed help accessing care. Um, as opposed to other things like the cost of care, eligibility for insurance. So we really saw a change in the type of calls that we were getting. Thank you. I just, well, I also wanted to ask, um, how are you working with the Greater New York Hospital Association and h, &H specifically? Because the service that you provide in trying to navigate health insurance is so, so critical because even for someone who is well-versed, it can be very intimidating. And there's the language barriers, there's so many things. So are you working closely to, to, to help some, how is the collaboration? Um, we haven't, within CHAMP, we haven't um, specifically collaborated with the Greater New York Health Association and Health and Hospitals Association, although the Community Service Society of New York more broadly um, does connect with both of those uh, organizations. We run several health insurance ombudsman programs, most of which have the same um, helpline number so that there's no wrong door, whether somebody's calling for assistance with mental health and substance use, which comes over to CHAMP or with a general health insurance issue, which goes to a different ombudsman program. We um, funnel them through the same helpline number to make sure that people get the, the services that they need. Thank you. Thank you so much for you know trying to address those disparities and helping people get the services that they need. Thanks so much. Thank you. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call you in the order your hand is raised now. Okay. Um, with that, Cheriala, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Cheryl Dahl for joining us today um, and thank all the panelists. I wanted to also recognize that we were also joined by Council Member Eugene. Um, and unless Council Member Rosella has anything that she would like to add, that this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.